Hi everybody, this is Josh with Talk About Trek, and I've just talked for 20 minutes into a camera that wasn't recording. So we're going to try this again. Uh, we're back today to talk about Star Trek TNG number 29, Sins of Commission. Now that I have a trial run, I think this should go fairly smoothly. Uh, Sins of Commission, written by Susan Wright in 1994, uh, is a very different Star Trek TNG novel. It is very fun. I did have a very interesting time with it, but it's, it is different, but she does it very well. So uh, let's first just go over the, the front cover here. Uh, first off, the front cover is Riker and Worf and a Ferengi Marauder in the planet uh, Lessonar in the background there. Uh, it might make you think that this is a Riker-based story. Do not be deceived. He plays a very, very, very small part in this story. However, uh, it is a Worf story, maybe a Worf Troy focused story, with some fun stuff thrown in there. From the back cover. While on a mission to save the planet Lessonar from an environmental collapse, the crew of the USS Enterprise becomes entangled in a web of treachery and murder. When a member of a strange emotion casting race is killed on board the ship, all evidence points to Lieutenant Worf and one of his oldest friends. Soon, the crew of the Starship Enterprise is crippled by an emotional onslaught as the surviving aliens respond in anger and pain to the death of their comrade. Worf must overcome the alien influence and find the strain, the true killer, with the destruction of the Starship Enterprise, the survival of Lessonar, and its Klingon honor hanging in the balance. Well, I mean, not. It's okay. It's an okay back blurb. It doesn't give away too much, but, uh, you know, it's not really the story that's told in the book. Sometimes I think that the people that paint the cover and write this back, they don't actually read the whole thing. Maybe they just get a little summary of it or something. Uh, but before we jump into the full spoilery uh, rant, I will say that Sins of the Commission is a fun Troy Wharf book. You get to see characters in acting in like a kind of a more extreme version of themselves because of this, uh, you know, emotion casting race, the Slee. So it's definitely fun. It's a kind of an easy, short little read. And if you're looking for something, you know, just kind of out of the norm, I would definitely recommend it. Uh, now, put that down. Jumping into the the deep end of the book here. Uh, what we get is really very different than what I was expecting. They started out thinking you're going to have this kind of rescue mission to this planet, and then the whole thing is thrown off on a curveball um, when this other ship comes in. So it starts out with Troy counseling Simon Tarsus, who, if you'll remember, was from the TNG episode Drumhead, and he was suspected of being a traitor, so they were having all these... Uh, I don't know what they were called. They were having all these committees and meetings on board the Enterprise to try to drown out the or bring out the traitor. Turns out there was no traitor. It was all just for naught. Uh, but Simon Tarsus did lie on his application, and he is actually part Romulan and not part Vulcan. Now, this is kind of picking up where that left off, and she is counseling him on like how he can get through that. He wants to run away. He wants to leave the Enterprise and kind of move on to something else to get away from it. And she says, no, you need to stay and kind of work through this problem. So that's where the book starts out. So it's kind of cool that she chose to bring in that character from that episode because I did think that that was always kind of interesting and did want to know you know, more, like where, where did that lead? So it's fun to have Simon Tarsus back. Uh, Counselor Troy senses something is amiss. And that's where that chapter ends. But the mission is the mission to Lessonar. And their goal is to help out this planet, which has driven itself into this state of a fully toxic atmosphere. So toxic that basically you can't transport through it. And people actually come as a tourist destination just to view the, the beautiful toxic colors of this planet. Uh, the planet's leadership has finally decided to call out for help from the Federation. Uh, they do that, and the Federa and they send the Enterprise-D, of course, to do that. So, uh, on board the Enterprise, they introduce a new character, Lieutenant Crisso, 
and she is a like an environmental tech and she is the one that's going to be working through and kind of leading the team to see what they've done to their planet and then see what they can do to, to fix the planet as well. So they get to the planet, they establish contact with the, the uh, grand so-and-so or whoever, and he invites them to a reception and is very glad that the Enterprise is there, uh, but doesn't seem to kind of want to get down to business. So uh, it's at this point when the pleasure cruiser, the prospector, shows up in the system and hails the Enterprise, and there, there you get to meet Captain Walsh, who is another fun character that uh, brought into this book here. And Captain Walsh has a, like, a big, long beard. Just kind of, I kind of picture him as, like, an old kind of ship's captain, you know. Uh, he is the captain of this pleasure cruiser, taking tourists around the galaxy to show them beautiful sights and, and wonderful things that they can see. And one of the sights is here, so... And while he has them on the phone, he notices, on the phone, he notices Worf there in the background. He says, Worf, how you doing, my boy? And it turns out he's actually an old friend of Worf through uh, Worf's adoptive parents, Sergei and Helena Roshenko. So, so now you're getting kind of the, here's the meat of the story coming together here. So uh, not long after they enter orbit, there is an explosion aboard the prospector and, uh, it is right in the area of the Sleaze uh, tank. Now, the Sleaze are a sentient race of emotive, I don't know, kind of like jellyfish, I guess. They live in, like, a gas giants, so they have to have, like, a special environment to live in. And uh, they have contact with the Ferengi. And the Ferengi kind of take certain groups of these Slee around, and they put on shows where people will sit down and have their emotions, you know, affected and enhanced by the slee. So this explosion aboard the prospector happens right by their tank. One of the slee is, is injured. They manage to evacuate everyone to the Enterprise. The injured slee dies there in sick bay. And as they try to, like, examine him, he, like, dissolves into nothingness right in front of Simon Tarsus, which kind of messes him up a little bit, I think. But... Uh, they get everyone off the ship. Uh, unfortunately, the ship is determined to be kind of too damaged to be repaired, too old to be repaired. Uh, so they have to get everybody there and uh, take them to a starbase or something eventually. But now they have this whole group of tourists on board, and they have to take care of these slee. And now these slee have kind of like a radius where they can affect people's emotions. So they... Uh, all the people that are around and watching them are having their emotions advanced, you know, affected and kind of like their main, whatever they're feeling, uh, amplified, you know? So, of course, with Worf, it's making him feel more angry, and uh, they explain this kind of background between the Klingon and the Slee that happened years ago, so he maybe is harboring something there. But everybody's emotions are getting a little bit kind of out of control, so they determined to like limit contact and move people away from that area. Now, this is when another or a Ferengi ship comes into the area carrying a whole colony of these sleeves. So now the whole now the area is like the whole enterprise now is being affected by this emotional amplification. So basically everybody is is kind of exhibiting some kind of quirk. So with Captain Picard, he's becoming more and more like quick to action and quick to make decisions. Of course, Worf getting angrier and angrier. Uh, Dr. Crusher is thrown into like fits of laughing. So the problem is getting worse and worse and worse aboard the ship as the exposure goes on and on and on. So Lieutenant Worf is charged with solving the mystery and figuring out what is happening here. So they do take a trip over to the prospector to try to, like, examine things and see what's going on. And really, they're not able to determine too much about the cause of what's happening. Uh, Worf gets a little crazy, kind of uh, interrogating everybody, interrogating the people on his own ship, trying to figure out who would have a, have a motive to either hurt the Slee or hurt Captain Walsh. Um, you know, damage his ship, damage his reputation, or whatever. So, uh, 
And then, of course, when the other ship shows up, and this is a Damon Brund with the whole colony of Slee, he's there and he's claiming, of course, that the Slee are angry because one of their own was killed, and he's demanding that the Enterprise either turn over the ones they have or kill them, and then they will move on. And uh, it won't do anything in the meantime, so... So this, they're trying to solve this problem while all of them are being overly affected by their emotions. And that's kind of what makes this book fun, is that you get all these characters written in this kind of extreme fashion that you're not normally expecting them to act in. So, uh, I'm trying to see. My notes kind of fell apart in the end here. But... The weird thing about the book is that the mission to save this planet is kind of shoved to the background in this whole murder mystery that's going on there. And they, in the one chapter they give you down on the planet, they show you how awful things are and that basically the, the ruling class is kind of doing somewhat okay living in the city, but everybody else is dying. There's no more sources of food. The atmosphere is toxic. So in this one chapter, they show that they're able to kind of do what they can, distribute biofilters and food and communications equipment, uh, which is able to uh, help them out somewhat and kind of keep them at least from immediately dying. But it just jumps from that right back into the main part of the story. So uh, and in the main part of the story, you know, Worf is again investigating. Stop doing that. Is investigating, trying to find out who is behind this, but is kind of going further and further and further out of control till eventually he has to be relieved of duty. And everybody on board is kind of getting to this point where they seem to be losing more and more control about what they're doing. And first off, solving the problem on the planet. Uh, they briefly touch, they have uh, this Lieutenant Chriso, who's the environmental tech there, and she's concerned and apparently being over-concerned about details and things like that, getting things right on the planet. So the, the mission is being affected because her emotions are being affected that way. But again, they, they don't concentrate too much about what's going on on the planet. It's really about just solving this mystery about what's going on there. And also how to communicate with the Slee. Uh, the Ferengi claim that they can. Uh, they won't say how. They just keep saying, oh, the Slee are angry with you. <laughs> but uh, uh, Counselor Troy has been trying to come up with something, but really they're not able to fully communicate. It's mostly just this kind of emotions that they're putting forth. And even they have a little bit with Guinan where she's like, all right, you guys just need to stop even trying to communicate with them because that's not how they work out. You know, that's, they're a different type of being entirely. And they reason and communicate with, like, emotions, you know, and we're different than that. So, so they're not able to establish any real helpful communications with them to kind of figure out what's going on. But through the investigation, they're able to determine, well, really... It's Counselor Troy's work, and she's able to kind of ferret out that they're holding back some information. Captain Walsh is uh, Mon Hartog, who is the Frangie in charge of the Slee, also holding back some information. So through her kind of work, she's able to figure out, and then they're able to get uh, Captain Walsh to, um, I guess, admit that he jettisoned some trash when they came into orbit. So once they learn that, they say, oh, well, in the trash, maybe that's where the bomb was. So they're able to do some investigation there. You know, they, the book is filled with all these kind of little character pieces where you get to see everybody kind of ramped up to 11 with whatever their emotional issue is. So they're like, there's this whole part with Jordy where he's upset with himself for not solving the problem. So he's just becoming despondent and angry. Uh, but Data kind of helps him work through that. And uh, it's very just it's very interesting to see these characters written with all their emotions kind of ramped up to 11. And that's really what like a lot of the meat of the book is, is just kind of all these different experiences you get to see there. Uh, the story is, in itself is kind of like a smaller part. 
and it seems kind of easily solved <laughs> well, once they once they actually get down to business and kind of get past their issues, you know. So they find out that uh, they send a away mission back to the prospector to scan some logs uh, right there in the airlock, and they're able to find out that what was jettisoned was Ferengi in origin. So now they have the, the smoking gun that they need, and it points right to Mon Hartog. And this leads to kind of the, uh, I don't know, the kind of epic conclusion of the book, where everyone is on edge. At this point, Worf has been confined to quarters and relieved of duty because he's just, he's too angry and he just can't do his job properly. Simon Tarsus is kind of losing it. The, he's being affected by these Slee as well. Uh, so you have this point in the book where uh, Worf just so angry <laughs> about everything that's going down, uh, defies orders to be can find a quarters and leaves to search out Mon Hartog to do who knows what at this point. But in getting to there, he spies Simon Tarsus. And Simon Tarsus is on his way to deactivate the shuttle bay doors, basically kill all the sea on the Enterprise. Worf is able to stop him in the end, and then they catch, are they able to sneak out and see Captain Walsh approaching Mon Hartog. And uh, he picks him up and starts strangling him, basically, and tries to wring his neck. Worf, at first, is just kind of staring. He's like, he's not going to do anything. But then Tarsus is like, are you going to do something? And he does scream out, stop. And he stops Walsh from killing him. And in the end, he basically determines that everybody's emotions were ramped up by the sleeve. So nobody should be truly at fault for what happened there, you know? Um, they take Mon Hartog to sick bay. He'll be okay in the end. He just kind of had his neck run out a little bit. Uh, and basically, Picard determines that it's at this point they need to get uh, the other Ferengi ship the heck out of there. So how are they going to do that? With a, a very good ploy, which is classic uh, Star Trek behavior, right? So he calls up Damon Brund and tells him that he can communicate with the Slee and the Slee are angry at him now. And he uh, to show him that he can actually do that, he goes down to where the Slee are at on the Enterprise in the shuttle bay and has that beam bright to Damon Hartog so he can see everything. And he talks to the Slee and he kind of lays out everything that the Ferengi were doing. And then the Slee can kind of get visibly angry. They, they change their colors to their angry color. So Damon Hartog kind of knows that something is wrong. And he's being affected, too, by the ones he has and everything. So it's at this point that he uh, turns tail and gets the heck out of there. And that's that. <laughs> uh, they're, they're able to work out the the problem with the Slee there. Uh, somewhat established, like a rudimentary communication. I mean, it's not perfect, but they're able to at least somewhat kind of understand each other. And they're able to solve the problem and, and get the Slee out of there and then uh, get everybody's emotions on the Enterprise back down to control. So, yeah, that's what you have. But what about the planet? You have a whole planet of people that are dying from this toxic atmosphere, which is a like a self-created problem, too. And they say that several times, that like they're doing it to themselves and they're not doing anything to fix it. So the, they do wrap up the story in the book here with a little bit of a little bit of an ending for the people on the planet. So uh, luckily the kind of the people on the outskirts were led by some people with some intelligence and they were able to use the equipment, the communication equipments and everything they received to to uh, overthrow the current government. And then once they were able to overthrow the current government, they are able to then start working with the Federation to solve their problems and fix their planet. And then there's just a kind of whole little part at the end where they're saying like, well, this is like a prime directive violation because we gave them that equipment. And then they use it to overthrow their government. And then they're like, well, no, because we needed to do that because they were in peril. That's like standard procedure. You got to give them food and communications equipment so they can save themselves. So th that ties up that whole little story with a nice little bow. And, uh, and that, that planet is now kind of on its way. They're following Lieutenant Crusoe's uh, recommendation 
and they are um, hopefully going to be able to clean up their planet. So, yeah, that's it. That's the whole thing. Uh, again, it was just a, kind of a piece just of lots of different interesting character things. I left out some things that they did here. There was a bit, you know, a bit of Worf and Alexander stuff, and even some stuff with, like, Kern that maybe kind of, I don't know, it was kind of different, but just part of the issue and part of the reason that Worf was getting so angry, too, was this uh, dealing with Alexander and Alexander kind of coming of age and earning his honor as a Klingon. So... That was a kind of an interesting part of the story, too. Just kind of an added little element to it, which uh, which did add to it when it made it very nice. So, uh, very nice, indeed. So, there we go. That's Sins of the Commission. I keep saying The Commission. It's not. It's Sins of Commission, which I think is a play on Sins of Omission. But anyway, Susan Wright, uh, this was her first TNG book. She did go on to write quite a few, and this was the first one of hers I've ever read, actually. So looking forward to reading some of her Deep Space Nine and Voyager stuff, which is apparently what she did mostly after this. So uh, definitely we'll look into that. Uh, being as that I just read 29, I will have a hard time stopping on 29. So let's see what we're looking at for next week. A quick glimpse, glimpse at number 30. Yeah, we got to stop on a solid 30 before we switch up. And uh, Captain Picard must free a planet from slavery. So that's what we got. Oh, look at it. Look at our baby right there. <gasps> our baby, the Anna. She's back. She's back. <gasps> well, that's a talk for another time. Anyway, coming up soon, Debtor's Planet. Uh, Sins of Commission. Uh, four out of five warp cores. It was a wonderful book. <laughs> I had a good time with it and uh, looking forward to reading more by Susan Wright. So uh, that's going to be it for tonight. We will be back soon to talk about more books and more Star Trek goodness. As always, everybody, so much. Live long and prosper. Thank you so much for watching, and we will see you next time. Bye.